Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the third lecture of the 2011 Food for Thought Luncheon Lecture Series. I'm Mary Kay Cooper, Director of Alumni Relations. This series is sponsored by the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and coordinated by the Alumni Relations Office. The series is designed to spotlight Trinity's outstanding faculty. Before we get to today's talk, I would like to tell you about an upcoming event. General Colin Powell will discuss diplomacy, persuasion, trust, and values during the 2011 Flora Cameron Lecture on Politics and Public Affairs at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday, March 29th in Laurie Auditorium. The lecture is free and open to the public, but tickets are required. Tickets will be available on a first come, first served basis beginning this coming Monday, March 7th at the Laurie Auditorium box office. There is a limit of two tickets per person. The box office is open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and tickets will be distributed until all tickets have been picked up. I'm pleased to have several special Trinity people with us today and I want you to be able to recognize them. They are Vice President for Faculty and Student Affairs, Mike Fisher. And Vice President for External Affairs, Tracy Christensen. I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded so that people all over the world can view or listen to it later. So during the question and answer period, please come to the microphones to ask your questions. Thank you. Our speaker will be introduced by James Sanders, class of 1998. James is the vice president of the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. James? Thanks, Mary Kay. Good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I hope you're all as excited about today's topic as I am. I've kind of monopolized our speaker already, asking very elementary questions, but uh, this is going to be a great conversation that we're going to have. So our speaker today is uh, Dr. Glenn Kroger, Kreger, Krieger. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to cover all my bases. And he's an associate professor in the chair of the geosciences department at Trinity University. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Physics from Pomona College his Master's of Science and PhD in Geophysics from Stanford University. His dissertation research focused on the development and application of new computational methods in earthquake seismology. Dr. Kroger teaches courses in environmental geology, oceanography, remote sensing, and geographic information systems, and geophysics. His current research includes the development of object-oriented, graphically interactive seismology software and field geophysics in Utah and Nevada, where he employs gravity seismic surveys to study the development of young active faults. Dr. Kroger currently serves as the chair of the IRIS Education and Outreach Program. IRIS is the National Science Foundation funded consortium of over 120 research universities and laboratories that operates the global network of earthquake seismic stations the U.S. Array of Seismic Stations and the Data Center for Collecting and Distributing Worldwide Earthquake Seismic Data. The IRIS ENO program runs seismology education programs for K through 12, undergraduate, graduate education, as well as public outreach programs, including lecture series and museum exhibits. So, can you all help me welcome Dr. Kroger? Okay. 
Well, I'm glad you could be here today. Um, this is a current map. This is real-time data of earthquakes around the globe. And anyone can pull this up on their computer anytime they want. And one of the things I'm going to teach you today is how to continue that lifelong learning we talked about here at Trinity, how you can go uh, and get information for yourself about our earthquake activity and not necessarily rely on the news media uh, to bring it to you. The other thing I always like to do at the beginning of the talk is to predict an earthquake. Uh, because everybody wants to know, can we predict earthquakes? And the answer is yes. Um, I predict earthquakes all the time, so I will now watch carefully. <laughs> magnitude 5 earthquake in the next 24 hours. Thank you. <laughs> now, now I do this because it's important to realize that the prediction I just made is 100% accurate. I'm always 100% accurate in my predictions. Uh, it's also 100% useless. Uh, and the important thing to realize is that predictions, uh, there's a very big difference between accurate predictions and useful predictions. Uh, and as we'll see, predicting earthquakes is not something that we uh, think is ever going to be possible. On the other hand, um, we have made great advances in understanding how to prepare for earthquakes, how to forecast earthquakes, and how to deal uh, with earthquakes. And yet, nature always has surprises for us, and I'll talk about one of those surprises today. Tumble over and fly across the car. 
Now, assuming that most of you don't drive Ferraris or Formula One racers or Corvettes, you can manage to produce about a half a G, about one half the acceleration of gravity when you go around the corner. Uh, this scale goes from 0.01 G all the way up to 1 G. So imagine if we took this entire room and accelerated it a half G, just like in your car. Imagine what the tables, the people, the chairs, the entire building was doing what your car does going around the corner. That's what a half a G would do. 1 G would be twice that kind of lateral acceleration. And as you can see here, uh, again, you've chosen pretty wisely. You could have done just a little better, but then your risk of hurricane would have gone up. So it would balance up. You know, and you could have moved up here, but then you'd get a few more ice storms. So overall, uh, assuming that you don't drive into a uh, little water crossings very close, you've chosen extremely wisely. <laughs> this is this map is, is tells us the two percent probability of having these accelerations in the next 50 years. So, for example, if you were to live in Southern California, uh, in Portland or Seattle, there's a two percent chance in the next 50 years of experience a 1G ground acceleration, which will destroy most buildings, even those that are engineered for earthquake uh, hazards. Now, we do have earthquakes in Texas. We had one just last April uh, down here in Alice. And I also was told by stand-up comedians that after you you know, tout and, and build up the, lo the locality you're in, then you should make fun of the locality. And so uh, our local news media covered this earthquake. Um, and as you can see, um, our local news media uh, needs some work in basic, basic math. <laughs> because they don't get very much practice. <laughs> so to something a little more serious, uh, last January, we had a magnitude seven earthquake in Haiti. Uh, the destruction was enormous. Uh, here's the uh, Capitol building. Uh, here's some more uh, pictures of the destruction in Haiti. Uh, the current death toll from that earthquake in Haiti stands at 222,000 people. Uh, and that's the low end of the estimate. That doesn't include the cholera and the deaths that have succeeded. Those are actual fatalities in the earthquake. Now keep in mind, that's 10 or 11 times greater than the four top natural disasters in the entire history of this country in one day. So one of the things we have to understand is, what's a magnitude seven earthquake? And we have a magnitude four in Texas. Uh, some of you may have noticed in the news the last couple of days, there have been some magnitude fours in Arkansas. In fact, Arkansas is a uh, hot earthquake country these days. We've had about 600 earthquakes since, the, since September. Uh, and the largest one was last Sunday evening, 4.7. Um, but we haven't heard of fatalities out of Arkansas, uh, and we haven't even heard of great building damage. So one of the things we need to do today is talk a little bit about these numbers that we call magnitudes. <coughs> you may remember that a year ago last Sunday, uh, we had an earthquake in Chile. Um, and to seismologists, the earthquake in Chile was really more spectacular, although not as tragic as the earthquake in Haiti. This had a magnitude of 8.8. .8. So we need to understand what 8.8 .8 means. Um, obviously, there was great damage in Chile, um, but only 521 fatalities. How can such a much larger earthquake produce so uh, much smaller uh, casualties? Uh, the Chilean earthquake also created a tsunami. <laughs> Those of us who were watching it sat, uh, watched the TV all day Saturday as this tsunami radiated out across the Pacific. The earthquake hit early in the morning, uh, and the tsunami took about 15 hours to get from Chile to Hawaii, uh, and so there were actually television cameras out in Hawaii waiting for it to arrive. Um, fortunately, um, the amplitude of the tsunami was very low, only a couple of feet. Uh, it caused water and some bays to go up and down, some rivers to turn around and flow backwards for a while. It didn't cause any loss of life or damage. Uh, and we, we suspected that, but predicting the amplitude of tsunamis is still a very difficult thing to do, even after the earthquake has occurred. Uh, but it's a little surrealistic to realize that you have many hours to wait after the event until the tsunami actually uh, hits home across the Pacific Ocean basin. As you can see, Japan uh, would experience this tsunami almost a day, almost 24 hours after the earthquake that triggers it. 
<laughs> so let's talk a minute for about magnitude. Um, many of you probably heard the name Richter magnitude. Charles Richter developed this scale in Southern California in the 1930s. Um, and what he was looking for was a numerical way of categorizing earthquakes. Um, principally important in this is he had to have some instruments to measure these earthquakes, and he had early seismometers to do it. And so magnitude is an instrumental reading. Um, it's quantitative. Uh, we can have um, a complete range of numbers that means something. The difference between 4.1 and 4.3 means something in the scale. Um, each earthquake has a single magnitude, even though there may be many ways of measuring it, and obviously we have errors in our measurement, ideally we get to the same number for each earthquake. Um, the values tend to be small numbers between 0 and 10, although neither 0 nor 10 are actually defined as limits. There can be negative magnitudes, uh, and there are. No one would ever feel them. Uh, and one of the fortunate, happy news items today is it's probably impossible for the Earth to create a magnitude 10 earthquake. Um, as we'll see, the size of the uh, plates of the Earth, the size of the faults on the Earth, the strength of the rock of the Earth probably just isn't enough to make an earthquake that will ever hit 10. And we've never seen a 10, even though NBC has done a miniseries about one. Um, now, these numbers, earthquakes range enormously in size. And one of the, one of the brilliant insights that Richter had was to, to realize that if you're going to take something that ranges enormously in size and compress it down to some numbers that people are comfortable with, you take the logarithm of the numbers. And so these numbers are based on logarithms, and we'll see that that's important as well. Uh, finally, there are no units. If a, it's not a 7.0 anything. It's not 7.0 newtons or meters or kilometers. There are no units. These are simply a, a, a scale uh, to rate earthquakes. Um, well, how many of these things do we have? We divide these into some classes. We call anything with a magnitude greater than 8 a great earthquake. Um, notice I put 8 to 9.5 question mark. 9.5 is the largest earthquake we've ever measured. Um, and we don't know if we can go higher. We'd rather not test that in the scale. Um, on the average, there's one a year. We haven't had one this year. We had one last year, obviously, the Chilean earthquake at 8.8. Um, and some years we have more, some years we have less. But the long-term average is about one a year. Earthquakes in the sevens, 7, 7.0 to 7.9, are what we call major earthquakes. And typically, we have one, we have about 15 a year. Um, now, what I tell my students is, if you have trouble with numbers like 15 and one, just remember <laughs> that we have a couple of a couple of months. You know. One a month to a month, it depends on the month. But, but you know, I, I could have predicted that in the next month we'll have a magnitude 7, and, and I'd be right there too. Magnitude 6 earthquakes are strong earthquakes. Um, we have a couple of those a week. That's why I'm perfectly happy to always predict in my classes that by next week there'll be a magnitude 6 earthquake, and there always is, because there are 130 plus a year on the Earth. When we get down into the fives, now we're talking about lots of earthquakes uh, in the thousands. Uh, we can measure fives all over the world with modern networks. Uh, and so we get an accurate count of those uh, moderate earthquakes. Uh, smaller than five, we have trouble. We may not catch them all. Uh, if they occur out in the middle of the Indian Ocean or uh, in some part of Central Asia where we don't have uh, seismic networks locally, we may miss some of these. So this number is an estimate, but typically something on the order of 13,000 or so a year. Um, so we're talking about hundreds of earthquakes every day being recorded somewhere in the world. And typically when people ask how many earthquakes do we record a year, we use numbers on the order of 30,000 if we look at all of the earthquakes. Because obviously in places like California, uh, where we have lots of dense networks, we, re we record much smaller earthquakes. Uh, there was actually an earthquake in Texas yesterday. Uh, it was out near um, Abilene, Sweetwater, kind of in that area. It had a magnitude of 2.5. We record that in the US. If that had happened in the middle of Asia, we might not have recorded it. But we'll come back to that 30,000 a year. Um, so these are our averages in a year. How are we doing uh, recently? Well, last year we had a pretty good year. Uh, we had the one great earthquake. Uh, it was a big year for major earthquakes. We had 21. 150 strong earthquakes. 1,900 moderate earthquakes, uh, and we only recorded about 11,000 uh, 
smaller earthquakes last year. Um, so far this year, uh, no great earthquakes. We've had four uh, major earthquakes so far this year. If you just multiply by how many days into the year we are, it suggests that we could have as many as 24 if we continue at this rate. Uh, we've had 28 uh, strong earthquakes, and if you multiply that, it's 170. Uh, and so with the fives, we might have as many as 1,700. So we're off to a pretty good start uh, this year as well. But these things are unpredictable. People always say, are we having more earthquakes than normal? And I like to point out that it's a random process. Uh, there is no normal. If we always had the same amount, it wouldn't be a random process. Uh, so it has to vary. Uh, some years we're going to have bumper crops, some years we won't. For example, how many of you or have burned in your mind the fact that 2007 was an enormous year for earthquakes. Well, I would venture to guess, but, and yet uh, 2007 actually was a year. We had four great earthquakes in 2007. Uh, fortunately, most of them were in places where the, the damage and loss of life was, was minimal. Now, I mentioned that Richter had the foresight to, to use logarithms to keep these numbers small and reasonable, but that has a side effect. And what it means is that small changes in those numbers mean enormous changes in what the earthquake does. A change of one unit in magnitude means the ground moves 10 times farther. So if this room shook by a millimeter, you know, the thickness of your fingernail, or two fingernails, depending on what fingernail polish you use, um, if it shook that far in a magnitude five earthquake, uh, in a magnitude 6 earthquake, it would shake by a centimeter, about a half an inch. Uh, in a magnitude uh, 7 earthquake, it would shake by a decimeter, about the length of a cigarette. And in a magnitude 8 earthquake, it would shake back and forth by a meter. Uh, if this room shook back and forth by a meter, uh, you would um, go for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> the energy release is even more spectacular. One unit of magnitude accounts for 30 times more energy. <coughs> So a lot of times, and this is important in places like California, people will they'll have it at magnitude six, let's say in LA. People will say, wow, did that, did that lessen the chance? Did that relieve the strain? Did that you know, put off the great magnitude eight earthquake that's, that's, that we're due for? And the answer is, not much. Because it would take 950 magnitude sixes to release the strain energy that's built up for that eight. So in LA, you have to ask the question, would I rather have a thousand magnitude sixes or would I rather just take it all in one magnitude eight? And as we'll see in LA, the answer is you need both. Um, <laughs> just to compare Chile and Haiti, though, the ground shook 63 times farther in Chile than in Haiti. And the energy release of the Chilean earthquake was 500 times greater than the energy release in the Haitian earthquake. And yet, 220,000 people died in Haiti. 500 people died in Chile, mostly uh, from the resulting tsunami and the failure of the naval alert system to work. So a couple of things about how earthquakes work that I think are important for everybody to know. First of all, um, big faults make big earthquakes. It seems fairly simple, and we like to remind people that really Earth science is pretty straightforward. Uh, but as you can see here, a magnitude 6 earthquake, we expect the fault to have dimensions of, oh, a few kilometers. By the time we get up into magnitude 7 earthquakes, like Haiti, we might expect the dimensions of the fault to be several tens of kilometers. But in order to have a magnitude 8 earthquake, we need to begin to have faults that have dimensions of hundreds of kilometers. And so we need bigger faults larger earth movement, more plate tectonic activity to produce those larger magnitude earthquakes. Um, here's an actual map of the motion on the fault in the Haitian earthquake. So let me kind of give you a sense of what this is. Um, across the top, we have the dimensions of the fault. And you can see that the length is about, oh, 50, 60 kilometers or so. And that's what we said, a magnitude 7 earthquake means a fault that's on the order of tens of kilometers. Uh, and the rupture went down into the ground, oh, something on the order of 12 or 15 kilometers. The entire rupture took place over all of the shaded area. The arrows show you how the fault slipped. And the colors tell you how much the fault slipped. So the maximum slippage took place in here. Uh, and the slippage out on this part of the fault was much smaller, although the directions were a little different. The entire earthquake started at that point, that's where the break began, but then it radiated out across that fault surface. And these lines tell us how fast 
that radiation took place. So these are at five seconds. So the fault began to break here, and five seconds later it was breaking along this line. After 10 seconds over here, 15, 20, 25, 30, and after about 35 seconds or so, this earthquake was done. Here's a similar map for Chile. Now notice, first of all, the scale is very different. We're talking hundreds of kilometers. I mean, this is 700 to 800 kilometers across here. And the fault rupture was concentrated here, but extended well out into the peripheries. And notice it also extended much deeper, uh, hundreds of kilometers down into the Earth, essentially breaking through the entire plate, the entire lithosphere of the planet. Again, the rupture started here and radiated out. Uh, but now each one of these lines is a five second interval, and you see we, it takes a lot longer to break a big fault. After 30 seconds, all we've done is broken this much. After a minute, we've broken this much. It takes almost three minutes for this earthquake to rupture that entire area of fault to produce an earthquake of that magnitude. Uh, just to compare the two uh, on the same scale, um, that's how they the fault area in Haiti would be if we map them to the same scale. So big faults make big earthquakes. Big earthquakes last longer. The Haitian earthquake was over in 30 seconds. The Chilean earthquake took three minutes. As you can see, there's a very nice fit, again, between the duration of an earthquake and its magnitude. Um, with the dense seismic networks that we have today, we can actually make real-time maps of how faults are breaking. And this is an example um, from uh, Miyake Ishii at Harvard and her student Eric Kaiser. So on the left here, we have a map. Uh, this is to the same scale as the map. So here's the town of Concepcion and Santiago, the capital. Uh, these dots represent uh, aftershock locations. But what I'm going to do now is run a movie that shows you how the fault ruptured in that earthquake. So here we go. I'm going to start the earthquake. Bang. And now you see the earthquake beginning to rupture there. And now it'll spread away from the epicenter, mostly toward the north. And it's slipping much more as it moves to the north. Here we are in a minute, uh, two minutes. And then finally, after three minutes, the whole thing comes to a halt. We run that again. You'll also notice that a, a separate rupture blob kind of propagates out here to the south. So this fault is breaking in all directions over three minutes to produce an earthquake of that size. Here's that big blob down here. So again, big faults make big earthquakes. Big earthquakes take a long time to rupture the ground. Now, I gotta let you on a secret. We don't use magnitudes. <laughs> uh, starting in the 1960s, it became clear that magnitudes had some problems from a scientific nature, not the least of which is the fact that they don't have any units. They don't tell us anything about the Earth. Uh, so seismologists actually use something we call seismic moment. Uh, seismic moment has a real meaning. Uh, and the best way to think about it is, I always like to say it's sort of like if you break a rubber band, you know what things determine how bad your fingers hurt, right? <laughs> the farther you stretch the rubber band, the more it hurts, right? So that's how much the fault slips. Um, if you've got a big, fat, thick rubber band, it hurts more than a skinny little one, right? That's the fault area. Uh, and finally, you know, if you get a, a rubber band that's really stiff and you break that, that's going to hurt a lot more than one of those really easy, springy ones, right? So essentially, this is just rubber band technology, but uh, the size of the <laughs> is basically fault area times how far the fault slips times the rock strength. And if you work that out, it turns out it has units of torque. So for those of you that do uh, work on your cars on the weekend, it's, this is something you can measure with your torque wrench. Um, now, if we're going to deal with earthquakes that are greater than the mid-7s, we actually have to calculate the moment because it turns out the traditional magnitude measures don't work for those earthquakes. And that's how we discovered the problems with the magnitude in the first place. Uh, the problem, though, is that we don't take the logarithm like Richter did. And that means that the numbers for seismic moment are messy. They have exponents. You know. Um, we can't really imagine Katie Couric on the evening news telling us that today there was an earthquake that had a seismic moment of you know, 3.7 times 10 to the 24th nine centimeters. That just doesn't <laughs> flow perfectly off of Katie's tongue. And so what we, what we do is we 
calculate the seismic moment, but then we put it in a magic little formula that turns it back into a magnitude. And we call that the moment magnitude. And today, the magnitudes that you see for any large earthquake will be a moment magnitude. 20 years ago, it was, uh, was a master's thesis or even a PhD thesis to calculate a magnitude, a moment magnitude. Today, it's done automatically with computers in a matter of hours after the event, once the data flows in. And with worldwide networks, we get that digital data within hours. Um, this, this accounts for the fact that some earthquakes uh, that you may be familiar with in the past seem to have changed their magnitude over time. For example, some of you may remember the 1964 Alaskan earthquake, Good Friday uh, in Anchorage. Initially, uh, it was talked about as being magnitude 8.5. And you'll still see it in some older textbooks as an 8.5. But under the moment magnitude scale, it turns out that it was a 9 point three or four. So it was a much bigger earthquake uh, than the older magnitude scales would have, would have suggested. So why is moment important? Well, moment really tells us sort of about the whole workings of the planet, the whole plate tectonic activity. So I'm going to show you some, this, this is all of the seismic moment for the last 105 years, starting, not surprisingly, with the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Um, so in 1952, uh, was the first magnitude 9 earthquake in the last century. It took place on the Kamchatka Peninsula in, uh, in the northwestern Pacific. It had a moment magnitude of about 9. And so it represents that slice of all of the earthquakes in a century. Now remember, we've got about 30,000 earthquakes a year. So the entire circle represents something like 3.5 million earthquakes. Out of 3.5 million earthquakes, that one earthquake did all that. But it was not the biggest. In 1960, we had the largest earthquake we've ever recorded in Chile. It alone accounts for 20% of all of the moment released in the last century. Out of three and a half million earthquakes, it took 20% of the seismic moment. Alaska, 1964, comes in a close second to Chile. Sumatra, 2004, Boxer Day, the day after Christmas, the tsunami earthquake, the great Sumatra and Andaman earthquake, comes in at 9.2. Those four earthquakes account for half of all of the moment released in the last century. All the other 3,499,996 have to fit, well actually, if you take one more out, they've got to fit in there because that purple slice is the Chilean earthquake from last year. That's the fifth largest earthquake we've ever recorded. It's the fifth largest earthquake in the last century, and yet it's not the one we remember because it didn't produce a huge fatality. All the rest of the magnitude eights, all of the great earthquakes from that entire century fit in that slice. All of the sevens in there, all of the sixes in there, everything else. The vast majority of those three million earthquakes fit in that little green sliver there. So moment really tells us what earthquakes are doing and how much they have to do with the, the planet uh, releasing the strains that it builds up. If we plot that on a graph, it's even more interesting. You can see here that uh, we start with the 1906 earthquake. There's the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. It's not very big. Um, we don't really get a big one until here we get the 52 Kamchatka earthquake. There's the 60 Chilean earthquake. There's the Alaska earthquake of 64. And then here's Sumatra 2004, and there's our Chilean earthquake right there. Now notice that between the, the really big earthquakes, between the magnitude nines, things go along at a pretty nice pace. In fact, if you fit uh, the slope uh, to here and here, you get about the same general moment release rate. The Earth is pretty much doing its thing. Um, and then what we've noticed in the last six years is that if we fit the same slope, up here, it's not the same slope. It's really beginning to look like the Earth as a whole changed with that Andaman Sumatran earthquake in 2004. And since then, we've seen the Chilean earthquake, we've seen a lot of magnitude 7 and 8s in Sumatra, we've seen a lot of 7 and 8s near American Samoa. But the planet seems to have sort of kicked it up a notch here in the last uh, five or six years. And, and to be honest, we're not sure if that's a trend yet. We need another decade of data or so to know if we've really seen a major change in the way in which the Earth is functioning. But again, it's, it's an intriguing uh, beginning to this next phase. Now, 
it ought to be clear that the magnitude doesn't really tell us about the human impact of earthquakes. So what are we going to do about the human impact? Well, it turns out we have another thing, and that's what we call intensity. Intensity actually predates magnitude. Intensity is just what you feel, what you experience, what broke. Um, people have been writing down intensities, well, since the middle 1500s. Uh, the largest earthquake we know of in history in terms of casualties occurred in 1556 uh, in China. And the estimated loss of life there was something on the order of 800,000 people. Um, these are qualitative, you know. The dishes broke, the window broke, my house collapsed. Uh, we can't really put numbers on them, so what we do is we put them in a ranking. Uh, and the other thing is that each earthquake won't have one number, because if you're close to it, you're going to see a lot more damage than if you're farther away. So with intensities, there's a different intensity at every location on the map. So we can't just have a single number to talk about the earthquake. We need a map of intensities to really understand what the earthquake is doing. Um, so we have a scale that we use for intensities. It's called the modified Mercalli scale. We use Roman numerals. And the reason we use Roman numerals is that you can't take decimal places in Roman numerals. The Romans didn't have decimal places. They hadn't, <laughs> they hadn't invented fractions yet. Um, so that actually makes it easier to deal with. Uh, and again, it's important to realize that these things really predate magnitudes. These have, we've been doing Mercalli intensities since the late 1800s. Um, I thought I'd just read a few of them to you. A two, for example, is felt only by some people indoors. Uh, and so only if you're paying attention. In other words, most of my students wouldn't feel a two. Um, <laughs> uh, unless, unless they're delicately suspended, which I guess they are at times. Um, <laughs> By the time we get up to a four, now lots of people indoors feel it. But outdoors, if the kids are outside playing in the backyard, yeah, they're probably not going to feel a, a four. Uh, at night, you know, depending on whether your alarm clock can wake you up or not, you might uh, be woken by a, a four. Uh, there could be some cracking sounds. It's kind of like a heavy truck going by. Uh, standing motor cars rock noticeably. I always like to point out to my students that if you see a motor car rocking, don't assume there's an earthquake. <laughs> By the time we get up to six, everybody feels it. Okay, you can't not feel a six. Well, mostly. Um, I, I love the oops, I love the next phrase. Many are frightened and run outdoors. Uh, if I could leave you with one piece of advice, that is, if you're in a building and an earthquake starts, don't run outdoors. That is the worst thing in the world you can do. The stuff that's going to fall down and hurt people is going to fall down on the outside of the building. The brick, the glass, all the stuff that's going to crush you is going to catch you as you run out the door. Stay put. Get under something. Don't run outdoors. That's, a, that's the worst possible uh, reaction to it. By the time we're up to a nine, general panic. Uh, now we have considerable damage, even in well-designed buildings. Um, a typical wood frame house is going to be thrown out of plumb. You're going to have, you know, your your wall board will be cracked even worse than it is from the swelling clays and the soils in Texas. Um, so there will be substantial damage to buildings. And some buildings will, will actually be thrown off their foundations by the time we get uh, up to a 9. And by the time we get to a 12, everything's getting leveled. Um, outdoors in a 12, you can see the ground rippling in waves. And in a 12, the ground acceleration, the vertical ground acceleration, can exceed 1G. That means literally things are flung into the air. Horizontal acceleration is even higher. What controls what you feel? Well, clearly the magnitude of the earthquake matters, but how far away you are matters a lot. So is whether the earthquake has directivity. Earthquakes are kind of like antennas. Uh, they're, they're seismic wave antennas, and they can aim their energy in different directions. And many of them do have very strong directional effects. So if you're in the path of that antenna, you're going to get more ground effect than if, it's, than if you're behind it. Um, and finally, it's really critical that the, the local bedrock and soil has a huge effect. Soft, wet sediments amplify ground motion. Um, they liquefy. You've probably been to the beach and you've shaken your foot on the sand and watched kind of turn to liquid. So soft, wet soils and soft, weak bedrocks amplify local ground motion enormously. Well, here's an intensity map for Haiti. 
And you can see, first of all, that the intensities, the red ones, are very, very concentrated right around Port-au-Prince, the capital. Port-au-Prince sat right on the epicenter. The epicenter was less than 10 kilometers away from the center of town. Notice that by the time you get out even 50 kilometers or so away from that, the intensities fall off. But the peak intensities reached up to 10. Okay, so that's more than that nine I was just reading about. This is, even if we had had well-built structures in Port-au-Prince, there would have been significant damage. But of course, we had very poorly constructed buildings. And so the damage was, was substantial. Um, we can compare that, for example, to Chile. And you can see that there's no red on the map for Chile. Chile was a much larger earthquake, but it was much deeper. And the epicenter was offshore. So everybody was farther away. If you have a 100 kilometer deep earthquake, nobody's closer than 100 kilometers to it. We did get up into the um, oh, intensities up around eight or so, and there was damage. You saw cars tumped over, but again, the, the shaking intensity just wasn't the same. Uh, also, bedrock is sturdier here, uh, less, less ground amplification uh, in Chile. But you can see the overall area was much larger. Finally, clearly, the vulnerability of buildings matters. Um, this is a way of sort of mapping a uh, percentage of buildings that collapse versus the mortality and intensity that's experienced. And you can see that for the kind of structures we had in Haiti, typically adobe and weak masonry, by the time you get up into um, eights and nines, you have virtually all structures being significant. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of construction that we see in Chile, timber frame homes, reinforced concrete buildings, now you can, you know, even up at uh, Mercalli intensities of, you know, 10, you still are seeing significantly less damage. Uh, New Zealand, uh, even better. And I was going to leave off this talk with this picture because this was sort of my three earthquakes, I promised. Um, these are to the same scale. Here's the shape map for Haiti with that very concentrated high shaking in uh, downtown Port-au-Prince. Here's the shake map I just showed you for Chile. And here's the shake map for last September's magnitude 7 earthquake near, off, near Christchurch, New Zealand. You can sort of see where the fault is, uh, the higher intensities there. The city of Christchurch sits right there north of that little peninsula. Um, this earthquake happened early in the morning. No one was at work. And there were zero fatalities, although there was quite a bit of structural damage. As most of you were aware, a week ago, there was an aftershock of this earthquake, a magnitude 6.3 aftershock. We gotta talk about that. <laughs> this is an, New Zealand was extremely fortunate back in September. They were extremely unlucky a week ago. Everything that could be wrong went wrong with this aftershock. It was only a magnitude 6.3, uh, and if you'd asked me would people be killed or injured in 6.3 in New Zealand, I would have said probably not. And yet, to date, we have at least 150 fatalities, and it's pretty clear that's going to rise probably to 300 or so once these buildings are, uh, are unstacked. Um, here's why you don't run outdoors. This is right out in front of Christ Church Cathedral. This is what happened to all of the brick. Um, if you've been running out the door, uh, that would be you. Uh, we had our own reporter on the scene. Tom Gardner, our, uh, one of our faculty members, is on sabbatical leave uh, in, uh, in Christchurch. He had just returned to Christchurch uh, the day before the earthquake. Uh, this was his email to me. He was on the third floor of the Geoscience Building. It started shaking. Dust, tiles fell from the ceiling. He fell off his chair. He couldn't stand up. Uh, he saw a glass shattering out the building. He climbed under the desk. Uh, and he was actually to the point he thought the building might collapse. I would have loved to see Tom under it. Yes. Um, I have no videos. These are actual pictures he sent uh, near, his, near his flat. Uh, you can see some of the damage that occurred. And this, uh, this picture down here in the lower corner, uh, these are what are called sand blows or sand volcanoes. If you've got wet sand up in the ground and you shake it, the sand comes squirting out and forms little volcano-like structures. Uh, and there was a lot of liquefaction in Christchurch. So what we really don't understand about, or what's really shocking to us about this earthquake is how much ground acceleration we got for such a very small earthquake. Um, this was the shape map, and the anticipated intensity was only around an eight, which would normally suggest maybe ground accelerations of a half a G or so. And yet, 
Christchurch is built on a lot of very wet sediment fill. This is the town of Christchurch. See a little triangular bay right there? Keep that in mind. Here's downtown Christchurch. There's that triangular bay. And these are recordings from actual strong motion accelerometers on the ground. This one right here experienced 188% the acceleration of gravity, almost twice, almost two Gs of acceleration. You can't build buildings that can stand up to two Gs of acceleration. It's just not doable. And that's right in downtown Christchurch. Uh, four or five of these experienced accelerations of a G or more. So this earthquake had all the right or all the wrong properties to create very, very focused but very intense ground accelerations, which is why the damage is so high uh, for a relatively small earthquake. So what about the US? Well, we always think of San Francisco when we think of earthquakes. And clearly, um, based on this hazard map, San Francisco is sitting here with brown. Uh, we expect, again, this is the 10% or the 2% in 50 years. So there's a 2% chance in 50 years that San Francisco is going to experience 1G ground accelerations. And that's going to do enormous damage. Um, well, we know it's the San Andreas Fault, right? Uh, here's the map of the San Andreas Fault. The last major earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault, the 1906 earthquake rushed into that part of the fault. The 1857 uh, Cajon earthquake rushed into this part of the fault down here near LA, and this part of the fault doesn't have earthquakes. It's nice and lubricated and slips along uh, very nicely and doesn't bother anybody. On the average, we have a great earthquake every 100 to 150 years in Northern California. This is based on looking at what we call paleoseismology evidence, looking back at all sorts of ground deformation, uh, plant deformation, things that we can see in the, in the geologic record. It's been now uh, 105 years. Does that mean we're overdue? Uh, yes, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, sometimes there's been as long as 250 years between these great earthquakes. Other times, they've been spaced as close as 50. What it means is if there's one tomorrow, it won't surprise me. Uh, if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, that won't surprise me either. But every year we go without it, the probability of it happening increases. Uh, the last big earthquake up there was the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, the World Series earthquake, as we all remember. Uh, this is the intensity map. You can see where the fault broke down here uh, near Santa Cruz. Uh, but you can also see around the bay in these areas where Bay Fill and apartments and stuff were built on Bay Fill. We had a lot of uh, ground amplification up into the sevens and eights on the Raquel scale. Uh, this is just a probability map telling us what we expect in the next oh, 25 years or so in the Bay Area. There's about a two-thirds chance, 63%, that's pretty close to two-thirds for me, a two-thirds chance of a 6.7 or greater in the Bay Area in the next 25 years. It may be on the San Andreas, but the San Andreas has a lot of company, uh, these other parallel faults. Uh, it turns out the most likely fault for it to occur on is the Hayward Fault that runs right through Berkeley Stadium. Uh, and then up across the bay, and as a Stanford graduate, um, Berkeley Stadium, who cares? Uh, <laughs> but there are enormous numbers of hospitals, schools, roadways, bar tracks, and so built very near the Hayward Fault Zone, where we'd expect very high intensities. Um, then there's LA. Well, LA had its last great earthquake in 1857. It has them about every 150 years. If I add 150 to 1857, I get, whoops, we're there. Uh, and that's one way to think about LA. We are there. Uh, but that's for a great earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. But the San Andreas Fault really lies north of the LA basin. And there's a nice big mountain range, the San Gabriel Mountains, that sort of provide a little buffer between the San Andreas and Los Angeles. So we might think, well, OK, well, LA is probably in a little better shape than San Francisco, but we'd be wrong. Uh, because it turns out that because the San Andreas sort of takes a big bend north of LA, and because the Pacific Plate's going that way, all of that LA basin is under compression. It's being squeezed. It's a big, thick pile of sediments that's being squeezed, and large faults are breaking underneath the surface, right under downtown LA, right under of the San Fernando Valley. 
Now the last one that needs to slip uh, was the Northridge earthquake in 1994. Uh, this is just a sort of a cross-section view. You can see LA sits out here. Uh, there's the Hollywood sign right there. Um, <laughs> and these, so we've got the San Andreas out here north of the mountains, but we've got all of these other faults that lie right underneath that sedimentary basin. And we've had some small earthquakes, five, nine, five, eight, and then the Northridge was a six, seven. Uh, but we haven't had a big one on one of those faults yet. Those faults can easily give us earthquakes of seven and a half or so. Uh, we think those occur maybe every 500 years or so. We don't know when the last one was. So LA sits here waiting to decide whether it's going to get its seven and a half down here or its eight out here, and the answer is ultimately it's going to get both. This is just a shape map for the Northridge earthquake, the 6.7, and you can see how focused, and then we did get up uh, into the nines and tens uh, in that earthquake. Well, everybody else is okay, right? California fall of the ocean. Uh, no, we have Cascadia. Cascadia is the word we use to describe the Pacific Northwest along the Cascade Mountains, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, uh, those lovely places, and unfortunately, they may actually be some of the most damage-prone parts of the United States. The reason is that the geology of this area is just like the geology of Sumatra. It's just like the geology of Chile. This is where one plate is diving under another. This is where the truly massive magnitude 9 earthquakes occur, and they have occurred. The last magnitude 9 earthquake in Cascadia occurred in the year 1700, it actually occurred in January of 1700. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have Japanese records of the tsunamis that were produced by that earthquake that match with paleoseismologic evidence that we have on the ground. So it's been 300 years. We think they happen about every 500 years or so. So if you're the glass half full person, you can live in Seattle, uh, enjoy the, the beautiful country, and say you've got 200 years to go. Um, <laughs> But if you know anything about statistics, you realize that it could happen tomorrow as well. So this is the this along with Alaska are the two places in the United States where we can have magnitude nine plus earthquakes. Seattle also gets deeper earthquakes that tend to be smaller. Uh, there was one in 2001 that broke up some of the buildings and disturbed the headquarters of Starbucks. Uh, and then it also gets some shallow earthquakes right in town. In fact, the Seattle fault runs right through downtown Seattle. But it's this big Cascadia subduction earthquake that we're concerned about. Uh, in addition to creating the damage from a magnitude 9 earthquake, those things will generate enormous tsunamis. Those tsunamis will have impacts not only in the Pacific Northwest, but all down the coast of California, in Alaska, and Hawaii, and as far away as Japan and Australia. So my advice is visit Seattle and leave. <laughs> I understand that uh, Dennis Albert was there yesterday, but he's leaving, so he's, he's doing the right thing. He's unfortunately heading to San Francisco, but he's going to leave there too. This is, so we think that the Sumatran earthquake of 2004 is a very good analog for what will happen in the Pacific Northwest, and this map is actually taking the fault area of the Sumatran earthquake and laying it onto the Pacific Northwest, and you can see it when this thing ruptures. Uh, that entire segment of the plate boundary will rupture all the way from Northern California, Eureka, all the way up to Portland, Seattle, uh, and Vancouver Island uh, will be affected by magnitude 9 earthquake. Well, who else do we have to worry about? Um, the Sierra Nevada front. Okay, we all like beautiful mountain ranges. And the best kind of a beautiful mountain range is one that leaps right out of your backyard, right? You can live down in town and drive three miles and you're in the ski resort, right? So, Reno, Salt Lake City. You know. Well, the price you pay for that is that the only way you have a mountain that jumps out of the ground that fast is to have an active fault there that's pushing it up. Uh, and that's what we have along the Sierra Nevada Front Range. Uh, that's not the only place we have that. We also have the whole intermountain west. We have Salt Lake City. We have the uh, the Tetons. Uh, Jackson is a lovely town. Jackson Hole is a great place to be. The mountains leap right out of the ground. That means there's a big active fault there. Uh, the Sawtooth Mountains, my book. All of this area uh, will have seismic activity. Now, lest you think that somehow earthquakes are just limited to Westerners and the 
east, the, the other coast folks get off easy. Um, that's not totally true either. There are seismic hazards on the east coast. They're not as great. We don't expect magnitude eights there, but it's not unheard of to have magnitude six or even sevens there. One of, my, one of the things I did in my thesis was to study the largest earthquake ever on the east coast of North America. It happened up off Baffin Island in Canada in 1933, but it was a magnitude seven earthquake. There's no reason that an earthquake like that couldn't happen off the coast of New England or off the coast of the southeastern US. Uh, Charleston actually had an earthquake back in the 1850s, and that's part of the reason there's a little, a little blip there uh, near South Carolina. Uh, and Quebec is very seismically active as well. Uh, most of these are small, but nonetheless, people haven't spent the last 100 years building earthquake-resistant structures in the east. And so a smaller earthquake will do more damage to those buildings, plus the high population densities will also feed into significant damage. So uh, Long Island is not without its, its risk factor. You can see that in terms of accelerations, not as great. We're not talking about 1G, but we can certainly get up to accelerations that will damage buildings. Um, and old brownstones and unreinforced masonry buildings uh, in those eastern cities will experience significant damage. And then there's 2012. Uh, we're all worried about what's going to happen in 2012. Hopefully, the best thing that will happen in 2012 is we won't have any more movies like 2012. Um, but 2012, in fact, 2011 and 2012 are interesting years from a seismic standpoint. Uh, and they have to do with that blob right there. Um, this is the new Madrid zone in the central US. Uh, it encompasses parts of Arkansas, uh, southeastern Missouri, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, western Kentucky, even the southern tip of Illinois and Indiana. What's going on here? Well, on December 16th, 1811, at 2.15 in the morning, there was a big earthquake there. Now, not a lot of people lived there at the time that wrote things. Uh, clearly, Native Americans lived in the area. But this was about, the, I mean, if you think about it, this was only five years after Lewis and Clark had come back from exploring the Louisiana Purchase. And yet, these earthquakes were significant. They were felt as far away as Boston. They did damage as far away as Cincinnati. That's rare for the middle of a plate. There's no plate down there. Well, fortunately, something like that doesn't happen very often. Except later that day, it happened again. <laughs> well, clearly, that's gotten it out of its system, and we're all OK, except uh, the next January, we had another one, the biggest of the three. The Mississippi River was actually diverted in its course. Lakes were drained. Sand blows the size of you know, this room were formed. Um, and then the final one of the series occurred in February. This is the New Madrid sequence. Between December 1811 and February 1812, we had four very large earthquakes right in the middle of the plane. Now, how big were they? That's a tough one. You know, we don't have any instrumental recordings. There were no seismometers at the time. All we have are Mercalli intensities, and most of them were far away. It's hard to project. Early researchers in the 1960s concluded, based on those shake reports, that these earthquakes had magnitudes of around eight. And for decades, this was one of the biggest concerns in seismology. It's hard enough to imagine one magnitude eight in the middle of the plate. How can you have four in the space of two months? What can possibly be going on there? Now, the good news is that these numbers have been revised down. You know, recent studies, GPS results, and other things have lowered these a little bit. So modern numbers look more like that. But that doesn't take away the fact that this is still stunningly interesting for the middle of the plate. Four magnitude sevens in the space of two months in a place that shouldn't have magnitudes at all. Because it's so rare, we don't know what the recurrence interval is. You know, in California, we know it's 150 years. In the Pacific Northwest, 500. We don't know how frequently magnitude sevens recur. <coughs> We're guessing that it's probably on the order of a millennium or so. But that's a guess. This part of the continent is a basin. The Mississippi River flows in that basin. It's being squeezed. And old faults, very old, Billion-year-old faults down inside the continent are being reactivated by this current squeezing. Um, the areas, this is a modern seismic map. There's a lot of small earthquake activity here. Fortunately, most of it's very small. 
But the question, of course, is when will we get the next six and a half or seven? Because a six and a half here will do great damage. Uh, Memphis isn't designed to withstand six and a half. And, and the shaking spreads very easily in the Midwest because of the geologic structure there. And so Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis, all of these towns, Little Rock, will feel uh, these are the place. And we don't know what the recurrence of it is. But the best guess is that it wouldn't surprise anybody to have a magnitude 6 earthquake in this area in the next 50 years or so. Um, I know after last night's first game, the thought of Memphis being destroyed is not so. <laughs> That's a tragic, but, um, but on the other hand, it does represent an enormous seismic hazard. Because we're now at the bicentennial of these events, starting in April, you're going to start to see some significant activity. FEMA is staging a big uh, reenactment, a big planning session. We're going to be uh, hosting a lot of uh, lecture series and stuff over the course of the next year because this is the bicentennial. Um, what else are we doing about it? Well, for the last decade or so, we've been trying to understand the continent that you live on much better. And we've been doing that by undertaking a massive science project that we call US Array. And what I like to think about it is a telescope. And that's how geologists think about it. See, we, at the National Science Foundation, the astronomers were getting all the money. They were getting all the big telescopes. And so we went and said, well, we want a telescope too. It's just our telescope doesn't have a mirror. What it has is thousands of seismic stations. Uh, and the NSF said, we can't afford that many seismic stations. And so they said, OK, fine, buy us 400. And what we'll do is we'll put them on the West Coast first, and then over the course of a decade, we'll roll them across the country. So that after about 10 or 15 years, we will have made a very detailed sonogram of the interior of this continent to understand. And right now, today, uh, there's where the stations are. We have an active one in San Antonio. There's a couple just south of San Antonio. This is the active part of the array. We've left some behind for coverage. And over the course of the next couple of years, it will roll its way along. We're currently in the process of uh, installing instruments in this strip and siting instruments here. And beginning this summer, we'll begin to find the locations of the instruments on the East Coast. Uh, the government has kindly allowed us to put them into southern Canada so we get a nice rectangle. We don't have to get this big notch. Uh, but by the time this project is done, we're going to have a much greater understanding of that interior structure uh, of the continent uh, and hopefully be in a better position to understand how things like the pneumatic zone uh, play out and maybe at some point get some idea of what the forecast is uh, for the future. So I told you two words. What were they? Contagion. Okay. Now, here's why. If a big earthquake happens and you want to find out what's going on, that's where you want pager. Pager stands for prompt assessment of something, something, something. But what pager is, is a system that's designed to give FEMA and other aid agencies a very rapid picture of both the loss of life and the potential economic damage of an earthquake. It's run by the US Geologist. And if you go into Google, you just type in pager, an earthquake, and bang, you'll be there. And I've done that. I'm almost out of time. But you'll get this, and very quickly, you get, well, for example, here's the most recent Arkansas earthquake. Green is good, red is bad. Um, it's, as I said, it was designed for FEMA. Um, and uh, if we go back a week or so, uh, here is the report for uh, the New Zealand earthquake. Now, Pager really blew it on this one, and that's why I like to bring it up. It did categorize it as a red, but notice the fatality estimates a 79% chance of 1 to 10 fatalities and only a 19% chance of 10 to 100, and yet we know it's going to go to about 300. Again, this earthquake fooled us. On the other hand, look at the economic damage. Um, this earthquake is estimated to cost somewhere between 10 and 70% of the gross domestic product in New Zealand. Imagine a disaster like that in the US, something that would hit 10 to 70% of the GDP. That's what New Zealand is coping with. So Pager gives you a quick idea of what the impact of an earthquake is. IRIS is where you go the next day to find out all the goodies. What we do at IRIS after a big earthquake is we prepare something called a teachable moment. It's a PowerPoint 
presentation. You can download it, and it tells you all about what happened. It's designed for teachers, for faculty members, so that the next morning after an earthquake, they can walk into their office five minutes before class, download a ready-to-go PowerPoint, and talk about the event that just happened, because that is the teachable moment. And the IRIS website is also where you go if you want to run this on your desktop so that you can see what's happening. And again, I end with where we started today. The red ones are the ones that have happened today. You see we had a couple down in Central America. We've had some over in Samoa. We've had a couple up in uh, the Tibetan Plateau, one up in the Kurils, one in South uh, Japan. The day's not over yet. The yellow circles are all the earthquakes that have happened in the last week. And so I leave you with the prediction I started with. There will be a magnitude 5 earthquake in the next day. I guarantee you. Thanks. <laughs>
These are probably being triggered by pumping uh, wastewater into the ground. There are a lot of wastewater disposal wells there. The water is coming from uh, something called hydrofracking. The hottest, newest thing in getting natural gas out of the ground is to go into a, a shale. Shales aren't rocks through which gas can flow, and we drill horizontally in them, and then we pump sand and water into them and break them up. It's called fracking, hydrofracking. Well, when you're all done, you've got all this water to get rid of. And so the hydrofracking hasn't been going on where the earthquakes are, but that's where the disposal of the wastewater has been going on. People have been just pumping that down disposal wells, and it just lubricates the ground. Um, so there's a, enough stress built up in the ground there to have threes and fours, and if you pump water down there, you get threes and fours. Pretty similar to what's true here south of San Antonio. I always like to say we have tons of earthquakes in San Antonio. Jordanton, Pleasanton, um, you know, all the tons have earthquakes. But that's because of hydraulic fracking and um, secondary recovery that's going on south of town. When you pump, when you move fluids in the ground, if there's any stress built up, you're going to get earthquakes. The good news is, both in Arkansas and here, the, the amount of stress that's built up isn't going to create fives or sixes or sevens. It's only going to create threes and fours, which can be nerve-wracking and cause very minor damage. Um, but it's what happens when you move fluids in the ground. Um, you know, we do sit on lots of faults. I mean, Trinity is bounded on the south here by one of the largest faults in San Antonio, the San Antonio Springs Fault. San Pedro Springs and the Blue Hole over in Carnot Road are both on that major fault. And of course, from here at the starting at the airport, we go up through this huge system of faults, the Balcones Fault System. But again, having faults doesn't mean you have earthquakes. You've got to put stress on the faults. Uh, these faults were very active 15 to 20 million years ago when the Hill Country was being uplifted. But today, there's just not much stress built up. And one of the ways we know that is one of the best ways to trigger little earthquakes is to build a reservoir. Because if you think about it, if I make a dam and I build a reservoir, the groundwater underneath the reservoir suddenly, uh, the pores all fill up with water. It's just like pumping water in the ground. Uh, and so when you build a, a new dam, one of the things you get is what's called reservoir-induced seismicity. Uh, in some places, this has been big. There were some very large earthquakes in India back in the, in the 70s during the great dam building. Uh, but here, when Canyon Lake Dam was built, when Medina Lake uh, was dammed up, very, very little seismic. So it's just telling us that the faults are there, but they're not under any stress. It's like the rubber band's there, but it's not stretched. Can't hurt you. So I think we have time for just one more question, if there's another question in the audience. I have heard a lot of different times about Yellowstone as a potential future earthquake. Um, it's part of that inner montane west. And, and certainly Yellowstone has lots of earthquakes. Most of them are volcanically related because it's a volcanic center. Um, typically, I mean, some of the bigger ones have, there have been fatalities. There was one back in the, I think it was the late 50s that caused a landslide that wiped out a campsite and killed some people. And the Bora Peak earthquake in Idaho uh, back in the, the early 80s actually rearranged some of the plumbing in Yellowstone and made old faithful, maybe not so faithful, or just changed the climate. So yeah, we get earthquakes up there. Typically, they're, they're probably going to max out on the sort of the six point of um, What you got to worry about with Yellowstone is that at some point it may erupt again. And, and when it erupts, it's been, well, most of us remember, for example, Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens produced about a half a cubic kilometer. So imagine a, you know, a, kilometer by kilometer by kilometer of rock, take half of that. That's about how much new stuff came out of Mount St. Helens when it erupted. The last time Yellowstone erupted, it produced about 3,500 cubic kilometers of Ooh. stuff. And it buried the entire middle of North America all the way into the Appalachians in, in ash. And so we would have ash falling as far south as San Antonio if that thing goes off again. Now, it goes off about every 600,000 years or so. It's done that few times. The last time it went off was about 600,000 years ago. So, <laughs> so, the good news, though, is volcanic activity has to tell us when it's going to happen. Earthquakes don't. You can't, Yellowstone can't erupt without warning. You can't move the magma up into the crust without the earthquakes and the release of sulfur dioxide all of the things that will come. So we will know if that's going to happen. I don't know how much we'll know, whether it's a month or a week or a 
year or whatever, and I don't know what we'll do about it, but you can't have a volcanic eruption without these precursors. They just are required. But earthquakes, if the stress is there, the fault's there, they happen when they're The other thing that's kind of interesting, I'll just leave on this note because it, it puzzles seismologists a bit. Remember that movie I showed of the, of the rupture propagating out in Chile? When you think about it, when an earthquake starts at the epicenter or at the focus, which is where the rupture begins, you remember bigger faults make bigger earthquakes. So when an earthquake begins, it doesn't really know how big it is. If it keeps going, it gets bigger. And so in many ways, the scientific puzzle is not what starts the earthquake, but what stops it. Because what stops it is really what's going to tell us how big the event's going to be, not what starts it. So fault dynamics are, are complex, and we're, we're just in the beginning stages of understanding this. Why don't we take this opportunity to thank our speaker one more time for today's talk.